Now please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 9 as we continue our journey through the Bible. Luke chapter 9. And we'll pick up from where we left off last time, starting in verse 18. And we'll probably only get up to verse 36 this morning because there's so much within this particular text. As we mentioned in last week's message, we are now entering the final six months of Jesus' ministry, and he's now going to go through this final sweep uh, in the region as he uh, goes and tells his disciples to go out uh, on this mission trip. And as they go out, they uh, preach about the kingdom of God, they heal the sick, they cast out demons, uh, they step out in faith, and they learn to depend upon uh, the Lord. We also saw the miraculous uh, feeding of the 5,000 uh, and the lessons of just surrendering all to the Lord to depend upon him and trusting him to meet all our needs. Now, as we continue on in this chapter, we're going to see one of the most important questions uh, that uh, someone can ask or answer uh, for their lives. And we're also going to see some expectations of what it means to follow Christ. So with that in mind, let's dive in verse 18. And it happened, as he was alone praying, that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowd say that I am? And so they answered and says, John the Baptist, some say Elisha, others said the old uh, prophets have risen again. And then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and says, The Christ of God. Now, Luke's characteristic phrase, as it happened, uh, is his way of changing the setting, to change the uh, scenery uh, as we continue on in the story. At this point, Jesus uh, and the disciples are moving north from uh, Bethesda up to Caesarea Philippi, uh, which the other gospel accounts fills us in those little gaps. And here we see, and we have this privilege of listening in to one of the private discussions that Jesus has with his disciples. But before we get into that conversation, you notice, again, Jesus praying again. That's the, the pattern that you're going to see all throughout Luke's gospel. It talks about Jesus' prayer life more than any other gospels. But oftentimes, he got alone to pray. And what an example that is uh, for us um, and, and for his men, the disciples there, uh, to see him praying. Now, again, as we see here, they joined him um, in prayer. We don't see that, um, which typically we're thinking that he's praying with his disciples. But never in the Gospels do you see him actually praying with his disciples. doesn't mean that he didn't do it, but we never read any record of it. Here it just says that they interrupted him and joined him. As one writer, G. Campbell Morgan, says, and he was convinced, the disciples interrupted the prayer of Jesus and says this, quote, A careful study of the gospel narratives has led to the justifiable conclusion that our Lord never prayed with his disciples. He often left them when he went and would pray, and he would be in their company when he prayed. It wasn't an association with them, but in separation, uh, his praying was on a different level, end quote. So, which is kind of an interesting uh, thought to think about. Anyways, um, but we see this interruption. We do see, again, another time when he asked his disciples to pray, but he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, stand here, stay here and watch, and he went over to another stone's throw away, basically, and he was praying alone. And then he'd come back and find the disciples sleeping. So after they interrupted Jesus, he asked them uh, the first of two questions. The first is, who do the crowd say that I am? And as we saw in last week's message, uh, either earlier on in this chapter, that Herod um, uh, also asked this sort of similar question, but is more of, who is this, uh, in reference to Jesus? Who is this man? Because uh, you know, he beheaded John the Baptist, and so he's hearing all these different reports. And here we see uh, Jesus asking, who do the crowd say that I am? And this is one of the most important questions that a person ever answers because if you miss the answer of who Jesus is, uh, you're going to miss eternity with God. So the disciples, again, they related some of the rumors that were going around, some of the rumors that even Herod was hearing. Some believed he was John the Baptist. Some say that he was Elisha. Uh, others thought he was an Old Testament prophet that has been raised from the dead. 
So that was the first question that springboards us into the next question that's found in verse 20, which is the most important question that we all have to ask and answer. But who do you say that I am? And here's the thing. It really doesn't matter what others think of Jesus. The most important issue is who is Jesus to you personally? That's the bottom line. Jesus is purposefully making a distinction between the crowds and the disciples because the question to the disciples begins with the word but. The crowds say this, but who do you say I am? And it's if Jesus is anticipating uh, a different response from the disciples than he would expect from the crowds. And this makes sense when you consider the disciples were a lot closer to Jesus than the crowds were. Again, they spent time with Jesus. They went everywhere Jesus went. And this is up to about you know, almost uh, two and a half years, almost three years with Jesus. And um, Jesus explained all the parables to him. They obeyed his orders. And so Jesus questioned to them, uh, to the disciples is one of the most profound and most important and critical uh, questions in all of Scripture. Who do you say that I am? And to this question, we see Peter answers, and, he, and he's really speaking for the entire group. He says, the Christ of God. Now, the word Christ there is in the, comes from the Greek word referring to Messiah, and of God emphasizes Jesus' divinity, because he's always pointing out the divinity and how Jesus is God. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, and Mark, chapter 8, provides additional information to this particular uh, encounter and inform, uh, information of Peter's identification uh, of Jesus as the Christ. Peter, as you know, he's the one that often spoke up uh, when others were silent. He declared what he had come to understand, uh, and he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So in his declaration, he is proclaiming Jesus to be the promised Messiah, that he is the King, that he is the great deliverer, he is the one and only Christ. You see, having seen all these miracles and uh, things that Jesus has performed, as well as the things that he taught, the disciples have come to the point where they now recognize Jesus, who is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, who was prophesied all throughout the Old Testament. So this is the core of the gospel message. Again, Matthew, again, inter, uh, interpreted the words in a Jewish framework by adding the living God. So adding that Jewish context into that. So just as the disciples had come to a personal understanding and acknowledgement and acceptance of who Jesus is and that he is the Christ, so must you and I. We must all come to that place. Who is Jesus to us? And Jesus confirmed uh, that Peter's response was not just off the top of his head, as the other Gospels will mention, that it was the Lord, the, the Heavenly Father, had revealed this to him. And again, there's many today who just say that Jesus is a good teacher, or that he was a prophet and a good person, a moral man. But if you listen to the things that Jesus said, that he is God, and that he's the only way to heaven is through him, then you can't just accept that he's a good teacher and that he's a prophet. So it makes that di discerning, where is he truly? Is he a li li liar, or is he a lunatic, or is he Lord? Uh, when you come to answering that question. But he is God, and Peter picked up on that uh, as the Father showed him, or revealed this truth to Peter and to the other disciples. And so the crowd looked, again, for a Messiah, um, and, and their own desire was, and, and for the people at that time, was a political man. Well, God's plan for the Messiah was to free man from the bondage of sin by dying on the cross for our sins. And so Jesus also added that he would build his church on Peter's correct understanding of who Jesus is. And from this point on, Jesus spoke plainly to his disciples about his death and resurrection. So he began to prepare them for what is going to happen to him by him suffering uh, and that he's going to die and he's going to be raised back to life as we see in the next set of verses. Notice verse 21. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell no one and saying, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. 
So Jesus warned, he commanded, he instructed his disciples to tell no one of this new uh, found confession of his messiahship. And then he began to tell them that he is going to suffer of his rejection, of his death, and of his resurrection. Now that Jesus finally revealed uh, to his disciples his true nature, uh, that uh, he is the Messiah, the promised one that came through the Old Testament that has been prophesied, the one who is the hope of Israel, you would have thought that he would now tell his disciples, now go and tell everyone. After all, wasn't Jesus mission to train his disciples to understand who he was so that they can go out and testify about him to every nation of who he is? But instead, we see Jesus now telling them to be quiet. Don't let everyone know. Probably because he didn't want this uprising too soon. Right? The Jews expected the Messiah to start a revolution and lead them to power, uh, but this wasn't Jesus' agenda. He came as a suffering servant, as the suffering Messiah, not as the ruling uh, Messiah. So why then would it be that Jesus didn't want his disciples to go and tell everyone, you know, far and wide, that he is the Messiah, that he is the anointed one sent by God? And to answer this question, I believe there are several thoughts here. One of them would be uh, that the disciples didn't understand Jesus' messianic uh, mission. They didn't know what kind of Messiah they had on their hands. They were expecting Jesus to become, as we said, that political Messiah, to immediately raise up an army and to conquer and, and rule over uh, Rome at that time. Now, Jesus came to the first time as the suffering Messiah, as Isaiah 53 mentions. His work has come to die and to come to the cross to die for our sins to, so we can be reconciled to the Lord. But the disciples didn't understand this truth yet about the suffering Messiah. And uh, we know this to be true because Peter's great confession that Jesus immediately begins to speak of his suffering and his death and resurrection. Now Jesus knew that he was hated and he was going to be killed by three things that we notice there. The elders, so this is a, a group that decided, uh, these are the religious and civil law, uh, a group of them included this Jewish council called the Sanhedrin. So that's the group talking about there. The chief priests uh, were not necessarily the, the ruling high priest, uh, but uh, those who were also formally held the title and some of their family members as well. So the other chief priests during that time, including all those in, currently in office. And then the scribes. These are uh, called the teachers of the law. These were kind of the uh, legal experts, if you will. So all three group of these men, uh, of the kind of, they made up the Jewish Supreme Court uh, that would sentence Jesus to die. But ultimately, we see that text that says that uh, the Son of Man must suffer these things. Not might, or uh, it's possible. No, he's going to. He has to. It's been prophesied that he must suffer these things. This was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophet spoken regarding the Messiah, that it was the plan of God before the foundations of the world. Isn't that mind-bottling when you think about that? Before he created the world, this was his plan. And uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 uh, tells us that he was foreordained before the foundation of the world and was manifested in these last times for you. We also read in um, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, so all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of Lamb's book of life, slain from the foundation of the world. So not only must he be slain, but he must raise again on the third day, and that's exactly what took place. But again, even his disciples were thinking the kingdom age, uh, that they're arguing who's going to sit at the right hand, who's going to sit on the left hand, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, and that will be addressed later on in this chapter. And then perhaps another reason not to tell everyone far and wide uh, that uh, he is the Messiah is because the disciples didn't yet understand what true discipleship consists of. They needed to understand the basic nature of what discipleship uh, relationship means um, before they were to go out and make disciples. Um, people have different notions of what a disciple is. Uh, 
And we know this to be true because, again, Jesus tells them uh, immediately what it's going to consist of. Again, Jesus not only suffering and his death and resurrection, but he begins to instruct them about the fact that to follow him means a person must deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow him. So there had already been hints several times to the other disciples uh, that Jesus was going to suffer and die for mankind. Uh, again, we see earlier on in uh, John chapter 1 and, uh, that uh, um, John the Baptist had called Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, Jesus had spoken prophetically about the destruction of the temple of his body in John chapter 2. So uh, this is the, the first of three instances in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus speaks to his disciples of his impending suffering, death, and resurrection. But we also see and, and know from the accounts of the other Gospels that the disciples weren't really understanding what Jesus was saying up until after the resurrection when the Lord opens their minds to this glorious truth. So Jesus goes on and talks about the cost of being a disciple. Verse 23 goes on to say, anyone who desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up the cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit of a man if he gains the whole world and himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, and of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and his fathers and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. If we're to pick one verse out of this chapter to perhaps memorize, I would pick verse 23. That is one of the key to what understanding discipleship is all about and following the Lord. The key to this paragraph is really as we consider Jesus, is he in charge of our lives? Is he our master? Is he our Lord? Uh, and then we've got to take up our cross and follow him. And there's something that... Um, the many Christians that they're, they're unaware of this, or they just don't care to, to follow this. They just think it's just being a casual Christian, it's a social thing to do, um, uh, but they, they truly don't understand the cost of being a disciple, or, or the cost of following who Jesus is. And so Jesus begins to tell his disciples what true discipleship consists of. So having told his disciples about his suffering, death, and resurrection after Peter's confession, Jesus now begins to instruct his disciples what is expected of those who would follow him. You see, up to this point, Jesus' uh, disciples thought Jesus was soon going to bring his kingdom. And this was their, their, their hopes and their expectations. They probably had high hopes and uh, big expectations and grandiose dreams uh, themselves. We know from the scripture, for instance, that the twelve constantly are arguing who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And again, Jesus reveals to his disciples that the, the whole idea of discipleship uh, and following him was wrong and upside down at this point because they think it's about them instead of taking up the cross and following him. And although greatness is uh, promised in the afterlife, Jesus' disciples are told that to what lays ahead of them on this earth because following him is the exact opposite of what they had in their own minds and what it's going to be like. The first term that Jesus introduces in the concerning what it means to be a disciple is to deny himself. Uh, so this is, um, you know, uh, a hard thing for so many people, not to gratify or to satisfy ourselves. If a person seeks to follow Jesus as a disciple, then we've got to set aside our goals and our plans in order to be directed by the Lord. But ultimately, when you're a follower of him, you know that that's the best thing you do. Because he knows what's best for you. He knows what's, how he's created you, his plan and purpose for your life. And, um, and we need to quit centering our attention on uh, enhancing and pleasing ourselves, but to focus on Christ. When you do that, your life is fulfilled. You're satisfied. You're, you're pleased. He's going to direct your steps according to his will. And, and, and you want to find out what he wants you to do every day and, and do it. Uh, don't expect to win popularity contests, fame, fortune, or successes. That may happen in following Christ, but don't let that be your, your consuming focus. Again, uh, Jesus allows none of his followers but those who he reigns uh, as Lord and Master. 
So when he's Lord and master of your life, you're going to be doing the things that he wants you to do. Uh, instead of, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, this is my goal, my plan, but does that match in the, the will and the plan of God for your life? Uh, there's the perfect will of God and what we call the permissive will. He allows things to happen, but ultimately you want the perfect will, and he'll hopefully redirect you to what he wants you to do. And again, this denying ourself cuts across the grain of our lives. It's contrary to everything that we hear in this world. You need to look out for yourself. You need to look out for number one, right? But you need to do what Jesus is telling you to do, um, you know, to do it his way. That's really the ultimate goal. When you're a follower of Christ, you're going to find that peace and satisfaction. You're going to see how he blesses you and takes care of you. And so whenever a person comes to follow Jesus, uh, it's required of them to, uh, to do things Jesus' way. Uh, and by his sovereign leading in our lives. And sadly, again, many churches today, seldom you ever hear not only the word sin, but self-denial, to deny self, and the lordship of Jesus. And many are encouraged to become Christians just by believing in Jesus, but they're never instructed to be a follower of him, to be a disciple of him, uh, to deny yourself, your plans, and follow the Lord's leading. But again, um, Jesus' way and his plan for your life is so much better than your own way. The other thing that we notice here, Jesus tells his disciple that a true disciple takes up his cross daily and follow him. Now, this was not an appealing thing to consider to Jesus' disciples. Crucifixion, as you know at this time, was the most horrible act, uh, and, and most people would never even want to bring it up in conversation. Uh, in our day, again, people wear uh, a, a cross as a form of jewelry or a tattoo or whatever, uh, but this was the opposite of response that you'd find in Jesus' day. Uh, wearing a cross in Jesus' day would be like wearing uh, kind of um, uh, a necklace to wear like a, a, a like an electric chair or some other uh, form of or symbol of capital punishment. Uh, that's what the cross was at that time. It wasn't until hundreds of years later that the church uh, embraced the cross like we do today. Uh, when someone has a cross on, they uh, are you know, wanting to display that they are a follower of Christ. Um, and as you know, the disciples lived in a world where a criminal was sentenced to death and they were required to go through the town carrying the cross that they would soon hang upon and die. Uh, carrying one's cross was considered a great humiliation and shame at that time. We don't think of that in today's term, but this is what it was when the disciples were there. Uh, and also the way that Rome forced and condemned a person to submission to the authority of Rome. The point is, the disciples got the idea what it meant to take up one's cross. So what Jesus is getting at is the key point in living the Christian life. To live for Jesus and literally live for him daily and let go of our old life. That you are a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away, all things become new. And also what Paul writes in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse uh, 12, verse 1, uh, to, that we're to offer our, our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him, which is our reasonable service. And the classical problem is that we uh, tend to crawl off that altar as a living sacrifice, uh, to do our will instead of God's will. And this metaphor, again, that Jesus uh, described of what becoming a disciple is involved, uh, he was to carry his cross to carry each and every day of his life. Not just one moment, not just one event or one Sunday, every single day we're to follow Jesus. We're to take up our cross, we're to deny ourselves, and we're to follow him. And again, thirdly, we see as Jesus uh, to become his disciples that we must follow him. So they knew what it was to follow Jesus because they were following him for all these years. Um, everywhere he went, uh, they were there. They left it all behind to be his disciple. They uh, uh, ate with him. They walked with him. Wherever he went, he was there. They, they understood that idea of what it is to be a follower of Christ. Following Jesus involves being more with him than anything else. Uh, a, a person who desires to follow Jesus must be a person who spends time with Jesus, desires to be with him, and that's going to naturally happen. 
Uh, if you have that struggle, then again, pray, Lord, give me that desire, that hunger and thirst for your word and for righteousness. Give me a desire to spend that time with you. And, and you start to carve out that time. Block in your schedule. This is the most important um, appointment in your day is your time with Jesus. And, um, and, and so following Jesus means listening to him, to, to obey his teaching, be doers of the word, not just hearers only. As Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. And so these are all practical instructions of the Lord. The word disciple, <clears throat> as you know <clears throat> from a previous time, we talked about a disciple means a learner. And therefore, they must take the uh, priority in studying the Word of God. So they might understand Jesus' teaching, his expectations, and commandments. And so following Jesus means following his example in everything that we do. What would Jesus do in this situation? Not to spiritualize everything that we do, but let him be the master passion of your life. And he'll just lead you and guide you, you know, even if you're not to the supermarket, you know, he'll have opportunities for conversations or where you can serve in some capacity someone drops something you can pick it up just a practical way of being kind and being a servant of the lord and you never know how those conversations can happen and as paul says in galatians 2 20 i have been crucified with christ as long as i who live but christ lives in me and the life that i live now in the flesh i live by faith in the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me for me that is one of the most important verses uh, in my life. Uh, I love that verse. You know, it lays it all out there right now. And as we take up our cross daily and follow him, we're surrendering totally to God's will and not our own will. What is your will in this situation? Lord? I want to hear from you. I want to and, and you take those steps of faith, and you'll see how he leads you and guides you and directs you. Uh, there's no turning back, um, you know, from following him, you know. Make sure that he is the master passion, your supreme focus in your life. And from that verse, we see Jesus use an illustration of what is good. Uh, if we have anything in the world has to offer, you're going to lose uh, eternal life. So what's the point of living for things in the world when you're losing eternal life? Eternal life, our relationship with the Lord is the most important thing and it should be in our lives. If we all live for fame, for power, uh, for, for money, and, 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 and care for nothing of his eternal kingdom, in effect, it's a wasted life. Because if we achieve any of those things, how much do they count for all eternity? Absolutely nothing. In fact, I even heard of a guy who, uh, in his funeral, instead of having a casket, he was buried in his Ferrari because he was so materialistic and he wanted to be buried in that thing. And, and you've heard the classic statement that uh, you never see a, 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 a U-Haul or a trailer uh, carried next to a, uh, a hearse, right? You can't carry your stuff with you. So Jesus, again, sums it up by saying, uh, you save the old life, you'll lose. But if you put to death the old life and you're born again, you win. So it's possible to gain the entire word if it was, but you lose Christ, you lose it all. Many people are willing to turn away from Christ in order to stay in a relationship uh, or hold on to sin or some bondage or to stay on a career path. Listen, no person is as important as Jesus. Let go of that relationship. Jesus is more important. He'll put someone else better in your life. If it's either Jesus or this relationship or Jesus and this work or this career path, Jesus should win. He'll do something better in your life. He'll give you a better job, a better person uh, that will lead you closer to the Lord. Jesus explains, however, that if someone were to gain the whole world, it'd be of no benefit if it means losing their soul in the process. And you've seen the bumper stickers, he who dies with the most toys uh, wins. Actually, he who um, you know, dies with the most toys is still dead. <laughs> it's not hard to see through the emptiness and superficiality of materialism. Uh, and the idea that meaning of life is to be found in things acquired, uh, trophies accumulated, which is collect dust. Uh, the amount of money made loses its credibility in the emergency room, on your deathbed, or in the funeral home. It means nothing. I've never heard anyone on their Beth that deathbed say, I wish I spent more time in the office. I, I, I wish I spent more time working. You know, you, you'll never hear that. I wish I would spent more time with my family. I, I wish I would spent more time with the Lord. 
So the answer to Jesus' question then is nothing is so valuable that it can be exchanged for one soul. So that's something each of us must decide for ourselves. No one can do that for you but you. Personally, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, you know. And I, and I hope you all say the same thing. And verse 26 teaches more specifically how to live for the glory of God. So to live for the glory of God is not to be ashamed of Jesus in any circumstance. Never be ashamed of him. According to, again, God's promise, Jesus will come again in glory and in power, and those who are not ashamed of him and live for his glory through much suffering will be rewarded and accepted into the eternal kingdom of God. That's, it's worth it all. On the other hand, those who are ashamed of Jesus, who, um, you know, of his words and uh, of being a follower of Christ, will be shamed and condemned. So never be ashamed of him. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe, as the Bible says. Now, as verse 27 is interesting, as Jesus says, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. And... Uh, in reading that, uh, many get confused, uh, and they argue that this never happened because they all died before the kingdom of God was established. And the reason they say that is because they don't read on. They pause right there instead of the rest of the, the context there. And again, you see, they will see a glimpse of the kingdom of God as they see Jesus in glory before them. Uh, as we read on, you'll see what I mean, the transfiguration. Verse 28, and it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, an appearance of his face was altered. His robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elisha, who appeared in glory and speak, spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So Luke tells us that the event of this transfiguration took place about eight days uh, after these saints. Mark's gospel says six days, so how can that be, you ask? Well, the answer can be quite simply, if you think about it. You see, Luke was including the day of Jesus' teaching and the day of the uh, transfiguration, whereas Mark's does not, uh, which gives you those two missing days. And again, remember, it says here that Luke says, about eight days. Anyways, the high mountain, as we see here, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. It was probably Mount Hermon, because that's kind of the closest high mountain in that region. There are some uh, that speculate, say it was Mount Tabor, which was only a, a low mountain, about 2,000 uh, feet, uh, but that's not in this area. Mount Hermon is the most likely of that. So if you hear of different conversations and arguments, uh, most uh, would believe Mount Hermon, uh, which is in the area of Caesarea Philippi. Uh, Mount Hermon is over 9,000 feet high. Um, it is possible that they went to the top of the mountain, but it is also possible they didn't go to the top of the mountain, they just went up on the mountain, as it says, up on a high mountain by themselves, as Mark uh, 9, 2 tells us. Now, what was confusing in verse 27, as we just read, about some who were standing with Jesus in the day that they would not see death until they saw the kingdom of God, while we see Peter, James, and John witness uh, Jesus in his glory, uh, and uh, like he will be in the kingdom age. Uh, before they died, uh, only some eight days later uh, from the events of verse 27. So that's kind of where you see that taking place. They're going to see it, you know, the kingdom, uh, before they died. Now, while they were uh, up there, they were told that Jesus was transfigured before them. The, the Greek word is uh, metamorphosis, uh, to change into, to change appearance from within. We get our English word metamorphosis um, from this, and so it's like caterpillar changing uh, into a butterfly. Uh, that's the idea with this particular word. And thus it was uh, what was veiled in Jesus's flesh is now revealed. We saw his glory, that he was transfigured. And as one writer put it, 
It says, a brief moment that veiled his humanity was lifted. His true essence was allowed to shine through. The glory which was always uh, in depths of his uh, being rose to the surface at one time in his earthly life. Or to put it another way, he slipped back into eternity in his pre-human glory. And it was a glance back and look forward into his future glory, end quote. So he was veiled. He, uh, again, he um, humbled himself in the appearance of a man. Um, and, and here we're seeing his glory shining through. Now, also with Jesus was Moses and Elisha, two heavy hitters from the Old Testament. Uh, in Deuteronomy, it talks about how Moses uh, um, was buried by the Lord and how he died before going into the promised land. He couldn't go into the promised land. Uh, so it was uh, up in, in this mountain uh, that he died. And the Lord buried him. And in Deuteronomy tells us that to this day, no one know where his grave is. And again, in, J in Jude, uh, talks about this interesting battle between Satan and, and Michael uh, over the body of Moses. Uh, Elisha, as you know, he was simply taken, raptured, if you will, into heaven uh, in a whirlwind. Moses, as you know, represents the law. Elisha represents the prophets. And so they're talking to Jesus about his departure, about his decease. So in other words, they're discussing Jesus' death. And I'm sure that they're talking about the purpose of his death, about was about and how he's a, to pay the price for the sin uh, of man to be set free to have fellowship with God the Father uh, once again because sin has separated man from God. Now the classic question is how did these disciples know uh, who was who? Right? It's a kind of a fascinating. How did you know this was Moses? How did you know this was Elisha? I don't think they wore name tags. Um, uh, either Jesus introduced, or what I'm hoping when we're in heaven is we just know who's who, and, and we're not going to have to remember everyone's names, and we just automatically have that knowledge. Um, but one of the, the reasons those two Old Testament key figures is to show uh, the three disciples uh, who were there that Jesus is the promised Messiah, uh, as predicted by the prophets and also implied by the law. So he's the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Uh, the text says, again, Moses and Elisha spoke about Jesus' departure. It means they, they got the idea what Jesus was there to accomplish. Uh, so none of the disciples got to ask any of these um, any questions, uh, as the text teaches there, to, to focus on uh, what Jesus wants us to do, uh, not what the law and the prophets wants us to do. It's about Jesus. And... Um, and the, which also could be one of the reasons why you, you don't see uh, Moses and, and Elijah. They, they kind of disappear quickly after this conversation. Uh, and again, it all comes down to Jesus. He needs to be the focus, not the law, not the prophets, not Moses, not Elijah or anyone else. Jesus is the focus. He's the fulfillment of everything there. Now, with all that said, let's come back to the disciples who were there. Why Peter, James, and John? Why only these three? Why not bring the whole group up there? Well, one answer would be um, is that God's law is that, uh, you know, uh, a thing shall be established by two or three witnesses, as Deuteronomy chapter 19 tells us. And therefore, the number of disciples represents a legal number of witnesses that is specified in Scripture. Uh, and as to the question, why these three? Again, as we know, Jesus, they were part of his inner circle. You know, he met with them individually several times, Peter, James, and John, uh, the closest of the disciples that he was training for ministry. And I suspect, as you know, that Peter was the main source of Mark's gospel. Uh, John, as you know, wrote uh, uh, the three epistles of John, the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation. Uh, James uh, was actually the first uh, um, recorded uh, martyr of church uh, in, in, for the church. So this is a different James than the half-brother of Jesus who wrote the Book of James. The point is that Jesus picked these three uh, to, to make a major difference for him and to understand why it was necessary to suffer in this life, to take up our cross daily as we now live our lives to make a difference for him and not for our own desires. So that was part of that. And you see the writings of uh, both uh, Peter, James uh, as well, and John. 
Uh, the text says, again, these three disciples were sleepy. So verse 32 goes on to say that Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. So, I mean, they're overcome with sleep and tiredness. So it might have been at night this could have encountered. We don't know the exact timing of the, the day or evening. It just says that they're heavy with sleep. When they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who were stood with him. And then it happened, as they're parting from him, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elisha, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came over, shadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And then the voice had ceased. Jesus is found alone, but they kept quiet and told no one in those days of the things that they had seen. So after climbing up this mountain, Mount Hermon, uh, the boys were tired. They fell asleep. And I think they, they missed some of the conversation that the Lord was having with Moses and Elisha. But when they woke up, they saw Jesus in all his glory with Moses and Elisha with him. And what a sight uh, this must have been, you know, astounding, life-changing. Yeah, you, you, you never come back from seeing this. I mean, your, your life is totally impacted uh, from this moment. And as these men were departing from Peter, knowing uh, uh, what, not what to say, he spoke anyway. He had that problem, as we see. Uh, he says, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles. And, of course, the classic joke uh, that uh, the only time that Peter opened his mouth was to change feet. <laughs> so... Um, Peter reminds me of the line that some people have something to say and then some people just want to say something. So that's kind of what we see typical of Peter. And, uh, and Peter was thinking, you know, this is what we really wanted all along. We want to see Jesus in his ruling power. Uh, so, so Jesus, don't die on the cross. You know, let's just worship you and, the, and, and, and the, uh, Moses and Elisha here. In effect, what we're seeing, God the Father tell Peter, basically be quiet, listen, um, as the next verse tells us. And again, you kind of almost feel bad for Peter, you know, uh, but um, like us, he has to learn about what it means to have Jesus in charge of our lives moment by moment. And I wonder uh, what these three disciples really said when they came down from the mountain, when they caught up with the other disciples. Man, you guys missed out. Jesus made us a promise, to, but I tell you these details not to tell, uh, but you should have been there. You know, they could have said these sort of things, and, and maybe they just saw there's something different. Like when you've seen something radical, you can see a change in someone's countenance. And so I'm sure that Peter is that one that said something, picture, you know, you guys should have been here. Now, one of the big problems with Peter's statement, if you um, think about it, um, was that he was putting Jesus on level plain with Moses and Elisha. Let's make three tabernacles, right? But that was a big mistake. Again, Jesus is Almighty God. These two men, Moses and Elisha, are not. So he was um, negating the cross, if you will, uh, and, and the pa uh, payment penalty for our sins. And so, again, as Peter was speaking, we're told that a cloud came over and overshadowed them. This cloud that came over them, no doubt, is the Shekinah glory, the cloud that uh, we see in the Old Testament. And notice that the Father didn't even acknowledge Peter's statement. You know, instead he uh, says, this is my beloved son, hear him. Now, as you remember, in Jesus' baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But here we're saying, now listen to him. So in other words, Jesus is infinitely superior to Moses and Elisha, to the law and the prophets. And that's what we studied when we went through the book of Hebrews. The law and the prophets were only partial expressions, but here's the final statement. Listen to Jesus. He is superior. And as the writer of Hebrews, again, we believe Paul, perfectly put in the opening lines in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets in many times and various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. So given who he is, everything depends upon listening to Jesus. Again, listen to him. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. 
on the last day of the feast, as Jesus stood uh, up there uh, with a loud voice in John 7, uh, 37. If any would thirst, let him come to me and drink. And also, one of the most wonderful passages in Scripture, Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and, low, and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for yourselves, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen to Jesus. Come to him. You know, and, and Luke concludes this account by saying, when the voice in verse 36 had spoken, they found Jesus alone. The disciples kept this to themselves, told no one at the time what they had seen. Notice that phrase, Jesus alone. That means Jesus is the focus of everything. The focus of the Old Testament, uh, the focus of history, the focus of eternity. Jesus is everything. Jesus alone. And so this voice affirmed that both the baptism and the transfiguration, as we see here, that Jesus is the one sent by God, uh, the one whose authority came directly from God. Uh, immediately after this, we see that Moses and Elisha are gone, and all that remains is Jesus. And again, people will come and go, uh, but the one constant in our lives is Jesus, because as he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And listen, to what he's telling us. We, we read that through his word, uh, and the Holy Spirit ministers to us. And so we need to stay in, we need to apply the word in our lives. The other thing uh, here is many times um, we, we can easily miss the point. Uh, you see, it's all about the cross and the death and, and, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That needs to always be part of the focus of our lives, living for him, denying ourselves, following him, um, but if you get caught up with other things, you're going to miss it. Again, always come back to the gospel. Always come back to the word. Now, as you, you, you read, um, how did this impact Peter's life? You know, he was dramatically affected by this. In fact, in Second uh, uh, Peter chapter 1, he gives it another magnificent detailed account of this. As we read in verse 16 through 21, it says, For we do not follow cunningly devised fables that have made known to you in the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, which the voice came from him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice come from heaven, and we're with him in the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed, as the light shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is by private interpretation, for prophecy never came by will of man, but of holy men spoke as they are moved by the Holy Spirit. Now that... Uh, moved by the Holy Spirit. It's like the, the wind in the sails. They didn't write anything that, that wasn't of the Holy Spirit wanting them to write uh, or to bring to remembrance. So everything that we have in Scripture is inspired by God without error. So as we see here, Peter saw Jesus in all his glory and that he heard the voice of the Father speak uh, and um, he was impacted by it, you know, as we see in this testimony here. Uh, so God's word is truth, and we can trust in what he has to say. And even though Moses and Elijah appeared in glory, which must have been impressive, Jesus alone is to be the disciples and to be our focus and our passion and our devotion. So it's easy to get distracted by other things and even good things, but if it takes our focus off of Jesus and the Word, then we need to let it go. Let that be the main focus of our lives. And everything will just turn out fine, you know, as we go. And there's going to be some difficult things that we're going to experience as believers in these last days. And, um, but we need to, again, keep Jesus as our main focus of everything in our life. Now, keep in mind, Peter wanted to stay up there on the mountaintop of experience, uh, and it's great to live on a mountaintop, if you will, uh, but uh, as we're going to see next time, and starting in verse 37, uh, there is a world in need, and if you stay on the mountaintop, you'll never be able to minister to them. Uh, so this is a, an important lesson that we'll see next time. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for this time together to study your word, to learn, to grow, as we see uh, this uh, important question that was asked, uh, who do you say that I am? And we declare that you are Savior, that you are Lord, you are our Master, you are our King, you are our Messiah. And so we thank you for revealing this to each and every one of us. Thank you for saving us, for redeeming us. We thank you
that you're in control of everything that happens to our life. Uh, we want to be followers of you. We want to deny ourselves. We want to take up our cross and follow you uh, daily. So we thank you for the filling and overflowing of your spirit into our lives. We thank you for each and every one here that you bless in a mighty special way. In Jesus' name, amen.